Um, you're not supposed to see this slide, <laughs> which you are. It's actually that's the joke. This is uh, this is the um, this is the presentation slide that I built because you don't always get a chance to actually see your slides, so you can see um, before you get on stage. So sometimes you're walking on stage, you've never seen it. I've seen it. Calibrate, it's amazing. Thank you for having me. It's been a good run. But here's the thing: you can learn from this slide. There's a lot going on here. This has nothing to do with the talk. <laughs> I can see the colors, how they're showing up, right? I can see how they've cropped it. We have a little cropping issue down here. I can see um, whether this, one of these is the actual typeface I use in this, and one is a screenshot. If these two things are not the same, my font's not there, and I will be destroyed. <laughs> um, and I like this slide. Um, also, you can see what slide is that. So, um, this is a, a talk that's not called the end. Um, this, I've had really the opportunity to speak at every single one of Calibrate. Thank you all for having me. And they know that I'm a classic, oh my God, I have this amazing idea for a talk. And I write it up and I send it to them and they're like, that sounds amazing. And then um, I write a different talk. So <laughs> what, what, you're, what, you're, what you're reading in the, in the agenda is not what we're gonna talk about. Thank you, uh, Calibrate, for being understanding and for having me back every time that I screw you like this. I'm so sorry. We're gonna talk about the product triangle. Um, I, uh, I wanna talk about the responsibilities of the different humans who are responsible for building products. Um, I, uh, I've done a lot of interesting, wait, that in there, let's go, bam. Not, not, not much better, but still there. Um, I've been working in the Silicon Valley my entire life. I was at Borland for many years. Anyone Borland? Show of hands real quick. Okay, yeah, it's less every time. Netscape, show of hands, yeah, maybe. Okay, good. That startup that you've never heard of, have you heard of it? Okay, yeah, it's all right. I was there. Um, Apple, um, Palantir, Pinterest, and finally Slack. Um, doing a lot of building of different products over the past 20 years and learning lots of all sorts of things. Um, let's get to know each other a little bit better um, as we, before we talk about this. So. How many engineers are here? Show of hands, engineers. Okay, that makes sense. Um, how many uh, product management types are here? Okay, and designer types, are you here? Designers, that's intriguing. Program managers or project managers, those types? Okay, sweet, you're gonna love this talk. Um, uh, HR, are you here? HR as well? How can you be HR and program manager? Um, lawyers, are you here? Any lawyers? <laughs> Okay, sweet, all right. Um, uh, sorry, more questions. Uh, how many of you have been starting managing in the last uh, year, in the last year? Okay, about half. Three to five years-ish, three to five years, okay. And then five years plus. Okay, great spread, awesome. Um, how many of you, last question, I swear, maybe. Um, how many of you, and this is gonna be super easy for you, are extroverts? Raise your hands if you're an extrovert. I know it's not hard. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> this, I think I've done this joke every time and it slays. Extroverts, raise your hands again. No problem. Okay, please just raise your hands. No, it's not hard. One more time. Okay, look around, everybody, because I'm going to do a thing that's going to blow your mind. Introverts, raise your hands. Is this not totally fascinating? <laughs> this is a leadership conference, right? And the majority of us, including myself, are introverts, so what's up with that? I don't know, I should write a book about it. Um, okay, here we go. Um, we're gonna talk about product and how to build product here. And um, uh, at Slack, VP of Product Engineering, uh, I wanna, when I say that, I, it's really obvious to me what it is, but I wanna define that super quick just so everyone's clear what product engineering is because I think it's actually something which is relatively new, although to me it's been around for forever. So there's basically two kinds of engineering teams. There's gonna be some vast generalizations here Please bear with me, I'll be here all day, you can critique me in the hallway. There, number one is, there's these teams, whether that's infrastructure. So, service engineering, DevOps, developer productivity, data, all of these folks, incredibly important folks. There's a whole class of engineers that are part of this. And then, on top of that, is what I consider to be product engineering. These two teams work closely together, infrastructure is building the Legos to allow our product engineering team to get things done. Product engineering is the entire stack. It's from the front end of JavaScript or Android or iOS or whatever it is, the mid-tier, all the way to the back end, and sometimes it actually plays in this world. That's product engineering. But perhaps the most interesting thing about product engineering that is a differentiator from infrastructure is there's product managers. 
We're saying this word a lot recently, accountability. Um, and I said there would be more questions, and here's one of them. Just throw it out there. When you hear this word, when your leader, when someone says, are you accountable for X, Y, Z, what is the definition? What is the word that you hear in your head? Just shout it out, anybody. Accountability. Say again? Responsible? Okay, right? What was that? Owner of a thing? Absolutely. Trust? What was that? Yeah. So everyone's wrong. Um, <laughs> and thank you for those who have seen this slide before and not shouting it out. That's not what it means. Now, all of these words that you just said are incredibly true, and that's what you're hearing. I'm not invalidating that, but it's not what the word means. Accountability. Actually, the best one I heard was from someone on my team. This person said, it means if I don't do that, you're going to cut my fingers off. And I was like, whoa! <laughs> and they're joking, and we're friends, but like, that's, a, that's not a good thing to hear, right? That's, there's this weaponization that happens with this word, and it's literally not what the word means. I did this talk internally at Slack, a, couple of month, a version of this talk a couple months ago, and I looked up the word, and I don't know. You know, every bad talk starts with a definition from the, uh, the dictionary, but we've already started, so I can do it now. This is what the word means. And when I read it, it gave my heart joy. What it means, what accountability means, and the thing I want to talk about and what I inspire you to do is it's about being required or expected to justify your actions and decisions, to give account for, accounting. Isn't this a healthier version of this word? A healthier version of this feeling that we have about it? I am accountable for this product, which means if we're going to do something, if we're gonna take an action, if we're gonna make a decision, I am responsible, I am accountable for being able to explain that to you. And to get, if I don't know, to talk with folks. Please tell me what you think about Why are we doing this? It is such a healthier version of, the, of than you, I'm going to chop your fingers off if it doesn't work out. And accountability, this ability, this empowering word that I'm throwing out there is really tricky because there's all of these lovely humans who are building the product and they kind of look like this. You have the product triangle. Now, there's lots of sub-teams inside of us. It's not meant to be inclusive of, everybody, of all of the teams. Engineering, the builders, product managers, and TPM, which is effectively program managers. I know you all know, oh, sorry. Uh, I know you all know this, but I want to be clear about the roles here. Well, start to be clear about the roles. Engineering, I know this is obvious. I've made a career out of stating the obvious. Engineering, the how. Building and growing the team. Aligning to a product strategy. Getting the right engineers on the right job. Setting clear, achievable, ambitious goals for the team building a strong, healthy team through actionable feedback. It's a lot more than that, but those are some of the things. The product managers, the what and the why. Managing a product strategy, defining a vision and a go-to-market approach, articulating the business value. If we do this, this is a likely outcome of what's gonna happen to the business. Voice of the customer, these are the humans that are out there talking to our customers and telling us what they want, synthesizing that, bringing it back to us, the builders, as an actual plan, and setting clear goals for the team. TPMs, program managers, plate spinners. The TPMs map interrelated set of, de independent, of dependencies and projects. They create a logical progression of work. They identify bridge gaps between teams. They partner with cross-functional teams with minimal escalation. <laughs> They help define goals, metrics, priorities, and the roadmap. And by the way, they love all this. They have great joy in spinning all of those plates. So the thing about this is, you're looking at this, there's a lot of different models. There's a lot of different ways to construct teams, product teams, if you will. And I want to talk about a couple of them before I give you some homework. So I was at Apple for a good long time and learned quite a bit. The model at Apple is a little bit different than what I just showed you. The model at Apple 
you'll notice I have replaced product managers with design. There are, as far as I know, I know it's not completely true anymore, but there are mostly no product managers at Apple. I saw in eight and a half years, I saw one spec and it was bad. <laughs> it was horrible. It was for iChat and we're like, what the hell is this? One spec, no product managers. Does anyone kind of get a little like, whoa, 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 about that? Like, what, why, Who, who's defining the strategy? And that was one of my biggest lessons um, at Apple was we looked around the table and we said, why are we doing this thing? And it was really quiet and everyone was looking at me because I was accountable for that product and I had to explain. I had to have a defensible opinion about why we were building this product. And I think that 60% of product managers are amazing, 60%. Um, but, <laughs> and they say the same thing about us, it's probably a little, but anyway. Um, the thing about it is I'd been used to having product managers in my, and I was always uh, waiting for them to tell me kind of what we're going to actually go and do. And for eight and a half years at Apple, it was put into me via drinking all that Kool-Aid that it was my responsibility to know why we were building and what we were building, along with an incredibly strong design function. And also, there is this guy named Steve Jobs who was kind of the product manager for the whole thing as well, which helped us. The, anyone at Slack has heard this from me before, but when I, when I go and I talk to one of my directors or someone on the team and I say, hey, Julia, um, what, Julia would never do this, this is hypothetical. Hey, Julia, why are we doing this? What is, what is the reason that we're doing this feature? And if she said, and she would never say this, and she's gonna hate me for even saying this here, because so you know we'd never, she'd never do it. She was, if she said, because product told us to do it, the hair on my back and I would go straight up, and it's not to say that product is not a talented group of humans and have a, have a very clear vision, but what was Julia doing in that case? She was not accountable for the product that she was building with her hands. And I say, that's not, like, I want to, you need to be able to explain it. And fine, it's fine if uh, John was telling you how to build it and this sort of thing and whatever, but it's your responsibility to understand it, put it in your bones, be able to explain it. Um, the other thing um, that I learned at, uh, that Apple is this PM role. How many of you have some sort of program or project management function in your companies right now? The program managers at Apple run Apple. They run the company. Because at Apple you have a software engineering team of 5,000 people. And there's a lot of interdependencies. There's a lot of different people who need a lot of different things. And they show up and they have this ability to gather signal and move signal around they're incredibly detail-oriented. As I said earlier, they're the plate spinners. And they love spinning plates. They are great at it. They create great joy in it. And they are world-class at it as well. These are intensely reliable, intensely detail-oriented humans. And they're absolutely essential connective tissue at some, so at some as you start, or it starts to get going. All of this work that happens, all this work that happens in here, whether you have design, PM, or TPMs, is going to happen. If the question is, who is the most capable person to actually go and get it done? Which leads me to my next one. Palantir. Huh? Yeah, no? Boo, yay, okay. All right, I'll just take it as silence. <laughs> Does this seem a little strange to you? <laughs> uh, they would hate I put this slide up here. There's designers there. There's not a lot of designers there. When I was going there, and I'm truly proud of this company, and happy to later tell you why I am, because there's probably a lot of opinions about this, but factually, the data is, the company is founded and run by engineers. When I left seven, seven years ago, um, all of the directors, and I was one of them, there was four directors, all reported to the CEO, and we were all engineers. This gets stranger. My job there was running real estate, HR, marketing, and the cafeteria. <laughs> if you check out my resume, you will notice 
None of those things I'm actually capable of doing very well. Um, I'm making fun of them a little bit, but it was really idea. It was kind of idyllic to go in there and to see, like, cool, engineers are running the whole thing. But I can tell you, well, number one is all of the work, product, design, um, all the other was being done by program management was being done by the engineers, and they were doing their best and they're trying real hard. But the best they're going to do, having never done it before, is probably a C. <clears throat> and they probably diversified since then, but this is not a model that I would actually recommend at all. They're, they're really good product for engineers. Okay, the last two have been very familiar and are the kind of the model that we're going to talk, mostly going to talk about here. Uh, Pinterest and Slack, both pretty classic product engineering or, or product organizations where you have a product function, a PM function, you have the engineering function, and you have the TPM or EPM function. It is a, a diverse set of perspectives. Um, at Slack, for a while, we had this model, and there was basically, for every pillar, there was a director of engineering, a, a director for PM, and a TPM as well. And their job was to equally represent their different domains, to disagree healthily, and to, when they, to have hard debates, but to represent their different, respect, their different domains, and it, that piece of having different perspectives at the table who are representing different views is incredibly important because ideas don't get better when we all agree. You actually want people in the room that are saying no or saying I have a different perspective. This is the diversity argument from a pure product perspective as well. We have the folks that understand the constraints of the schedule. We have the folks who understand the constraints of what we can and can't build. And we have the folks on the product side who are saying this is the business that we actually need to build. And that debate um, is fascinating. But accountability. The biggest challenge and where I've literally spent most of my last year is these gray areas between program and engineering, product and engineering. These are the confusing gray areas between the teams um, that are incredibly defining and the, uh, incredibly difficult and hard to define and you're going to waste a huge amount of time unless you followed my advice in one second. As a leader, that gray area is where you're gonna spend most of your time. Who is responsible for a feature? Who is responsible for building the schedule? Who is responsible for talking about the feature in front of everybody. See heads nodding, people going, like, yeah, that's interesting. <clears throat> the gray area, <laughs> is vast. And this is when you learn in Keynote, until the animation is over, you can't click, so we're gonna be here a while. <laughs> This is, this is pulled from various lists at Slack from a while ago. Phew. Um, <laughs> and as I go through this, I was thinking about this this morning as I was driving in. How much of that stuff that is scrolled by, some of it was recognizable, some of it was like, I don't know what the heck that is. But my question to you is, how much of that work, that's all work, that's all someone doing something and getting it done and getting an outcome. How much of that work do you actually account for? I'm gonna do it again, because I can. <laughs> How much of this work do you account for when you're building out a schedule? I think there's another talk, which I'm gonna call dark work, because this is a ton of work that we're not actually giving ourselves credit for. And not even to the point, not even to the hard part right now, each of these areas, every single bullet on this list is an opportunity for misunderstanding, for a lack of clarity, for two people working really hard on exactly the same thing. And this list is probably four times longer than I listed right here. So, uh, I normally talk in sort of abstracts and high level stuff. I'm going to do something very different here. I'm going to give you two pieces of homework. And here's the first one. And it's really simple. And I'm telling you, I'm gonna save you thousands of hours 
in tears and frustration if you choose to do this homework, both pieces of homework. Here's the first one. What I want you to do later, for you, solo, I want you to write down your key responsibilities, the things that you're responsible for, whether your product, design, HR, whatever it is, and, this is the important part, those of your peers, and not everybody, but the ones that you are most dependent on to get your job done. My responsibilities end there. Now, go to one of your peers and say, this guy named Wop or Rams, I don't know what his name is, said I should do this, it seems important, he's into typography and this seems like important work. Ask them to do the same thing themselves. Don't show them yours. They do the same thing. My responsibility is in yours. Now, this is the part that is the time saver. This is the thing that really, really matters is take those two lists and swap them. I guarantee you're going to be shocked by what they think is theirs and yours. And that is an opportunity to sign a contract to say, by the way, I'm responsible for the sprint planning. I'm responsible for the schedule, that sort of thing. For each of those areas that fall into that sort of confusing gray area, define a protocol, define, sign a contract, and just come to an agreement. I will, I will be accountable for this. I'll keep you in the loop, I'll tell you everything about it, but I'm accountable, I'll do this. It seems really trivial, but in this hurried, we gotta get things done and it's rapid growth, this work, this between the scene work between talented different teams is a huge amount of work. It creates miscommunication, it creates confusion, and it decreases accountability. I love this word. I love this word because it reframes something which is used sort of as a, as a threat into this opportunity to care about what you're building. And I think if you go through the contract process, if you go figure out with your folks, the folks that you're depending on, you'll be happier. Okay, the other thing I want you to do, this is gonna seem a little bit off topic, but it's not. So, um, I play this game called Destiny. <laughs> I'm not crying about Destiny. <laughs> um, and I play with this guy from Portland named DJ, and he's sitting back there. And I, I wasn't gonna add this to this part, but I think it's important that you hear it because I think it's important right now in this country, in this world, to say this thing about a video game. Um, you can play Destiny by yourself, but it's far more fun to play with other humans. In fact, for certain parts of the game called raids, you gotta get six people together. Is it six, DJ? Six, thanks. <laughs> um, together to actually go and achieve this objective. I swear to God this is related. Um, moreover, you, um, there's some challenges. The, um, the internet is full of colorful people and personalities. <laughs> and raids are complex affairs. Um, someone needs to lead or else everyone dies, and dying is bad. <laughs> um, I'm not joking when I tell you that this gentleman back here, and I've done this talk before, he's sitting right there, is the nicest, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, ma'am, but you, you brought this on yourself, <laughs> is the nicest, calmest, kindest person I have ever met. It's a restore your faith in humanity person. We, with others, have been doing battles with digital baddies for years now. Um, and there's a lot going on in a raid. And people have to leave. You're in a raid and you've been at it for two year, hours and you gotta go be with your family. DJ says, no problem, we'll figure it out, no worries. You're having difficulty in a raid. It's hard, it's a complex task. It's a video game, it's a complex task. And you've never actually done it before and the team is failing. DJ says, no worries. I, I remember when I had to learn this, it's a fun, ton of fun to learn. But never played before this raid? Forgot to tell us that at the beginning? No worries. We'll practice this together right now. It's, um, it's a leadership model that lends itself to the volunteer situations, but my ask of you, Calibrate, is why is this not the default situation, the default mentality for all situations? 
I've been saying this for three years now. Why not be unfailingly kind? On this planet, in this country right now, rage is simple. It's easy. If you want to find a reason your product manager is out to make your life miserable, you can just Google it. You can find a reason, you can find an opinion about why that person is out to get you. My homework for you today is to lead with unfailing kindness. You know what it feels like. You know exactly what it feels like. And you know what it feels like when someone sends it your way. It's the hardest reaction to take. It's the hardest mindset to take when the stakes are high and the rage is plentiful. But the way we lead is with understanding, with empathy, and with kindness. And if you don't believe me, spend some time with DJ. He's sitting right there with the big beard. Accountability and unfailing kindness, that's your job. It's been a lovely rung, Calibrate. Thank you very much.